Hello, everyone. You know, if I was to ask for a show of hands, of, of those of you who know somebody in the military, most of you would raise your hands. Maybe an active, you know, an active duty member, or maybe a veteran. And if I was to ask you if you knew, if you've ever heard of the words cerebral palsy, I'm sure a few of you would raise your hands as well. I mean, yesterday was National Cerebral Palsy Awareness Day. How many of you have met somebody who served in the military with cerebral palsy? See, now you can say that you've met, met someone. Hello, my name is John Quinn. I'm the author of Someone Like Me, an unlikely story of challenge and triumph over cerebral palsy. I was born with cerebral palsy. Couldn't walk on my own until I was about four years old. Partially paralyzed on my left side. My left leg is smaller than my right. My left foot is two and a half sizes smaller than my right. And I kept it all a secret to serve for 20 years in the Navy. I served from January 1982 and retired in October 2002. Never telling anybody about my condition. Nobody knew I had cerebral palsy. Now, what is CP? CP, a lot of people think CP is a disease. They think that, you know, if they come up and they shake my hand, and I've had this question, will I catch cerebral palsy? No. Cerebral palsy, what it is, it's a brain disorder. It's a brain injury. One that affects 17 million people in this world, over 800,000 people in the United States. You know, every case of CP is unique to the individual. I'm very fortunate. I have a relatively mild case of CP. Now, for how, cerebral palsy affects me in a unique way. If I, want to, if I want to move my body, I have to consciously tell myself to move. If I want to walk, for example, I have to tell myself, pick up my foot, set it down. Pick up my foot, set it down. Put down your arms. You know, that's what cerebral is. Cerebral palsy is a disconnect between your brain and your muscles. So my muscles don't get all the signals that they need in order to, to function as smoothly as, as I would like. I was born in Detroit, one of eight kids, one bathroom in the house. I tell everybody I wanted to join the Navy to get some privacy. <laughs> you know? I went through grueling physical therapy all through grade school. I wore eye patches to correct my vision. You know, I wore long pants all summer long to hide my skinny legs. You know, but my parents raised me to believe that I would do great things in life. You know, they let me try things. And, and so when I wanted to uh, join a wrestling team in junior high school, they said, sure, go ahead. Just don't come home crying, saying it's too hard. You better finish what you start. Now, I would love to tell you that I blossomed into an all-state grappler with countless victories under my belt. <laughs> that did not happen. In fact, I never won a match. But I kept my word to my parents, and I never quit. So when I wanted to join the Navy, my, my parents, I think they had their fingers crossed behind their backs for this one. I said, sure, good luck. So I walked across the street to the recruiter, and I kept my CP a secret. And I'll talk about why I did that in a minute. But I kept it a secret. And, and I, if you've ever taken a military physical, it's quite an ordeal. There's 50 guys in this room. We'd been there all day. It's a grueling process. And I thought, OK, I got this. I got this. Well, the doctors walked in. They said, one last exercise before you all become property of Uncle Sam. Get down you know, catcher squat and put your arms out. Right away, I was like, oh. Now, I was, at this time, I was six foot one, weighed about 128 pounds. And I was too weak to hold up my own body weight. I tried to do this exercise that they wanted, this duck walk exercise, they called it. Put my arms out, clunk, fell over. These doctors come over, so what's wrong with you? I said, nothing. I said, try that again. Clunk, fell over. Everybody started laughing, except those doctors. They said, son, <laughs> what's wrong with you? I said, nothing's wrong with me. They started asking me questions. Have you ever been hit by a car? No. 
Never break your back. No. And they just they gave up. And they said, Mr. Quinn, we don't know what's wrong with you, but we don't want somebody like you in the Navy. Go home. So I came through the, the front door of my house in Michigan there. My dad was sitting there. Now, my dad was a tough Detroit Irish cop. He said, how'd it go? I said, Dad, it was hard. Even for somebody with healthy legs, it was hard. I'll never forget it. My dad looked at me and said, Johnny, life is hard. Question is, what are you going to do about it? So the next day, down in my basement, I started doing that duck walk exercise. I did it every day for a year. And then I went back. Again, keeping my CP a secret. And you know what? I was the best duck walker in that entire building out there. <laughs> Past that physical with flying colors. And I was able to serve for the next 20 years. I served on aircraft carriers and battleships and destroyers. I worked on General Schwarzkopf's staff down in Florida. I am even a founding member or a plank owner in Navy terms of SEAL Team 3 in Coronado, California. I retired as a senior chief petty officer, which is the second highest enlisted rank you can hold. Not bad for a, a kid who was told to go home, huh? Now, why did I keep my CP a secret? Well, I wanted to be included. I wanted to be part of. I didn't think the Navy would let me in back in November of 1980. Come to find out, that's still true today. I get, I get letters and emails from readers of my book who ask me advice, and they've got a mild disability, but they're physically fit. They're strong. They're track stars and football stars and wrestlers. And they asked me, they said, what, what should I do, Mr. Quinn? Should I tell the truth or should I keep it a secret? I said, tell them. Tell the truth. You know, I, don't ever, I don't ever want anybody to have to go through what I had to go through to keep it a secret. So they do. They tell the truth and they're not even being allowed to try. You know, we need to fix that. And, that. and that speaks to really what my story is. That's what my life is. It's one of inclusion. Now, what is inclusion? Inclusion, I think the the definition in the dictionary is to be included, the opportunity to be included. That's all I ever wanted. That's all I ever wanted. I wanted to prove that I could hit the same standard as you. Now, originally, when I, fa when I failed that physical, I couldn't do that. What did I have to do? I had to, I had to get stronger physically. I had to raise my level of fitness up in order to meet the standards that the military wanted. But I was able to do it. And a lot of times when I talk about inclusion, a lot of people think, well, it's a lowering of a standard in order to bring everybody in, to make everybody feel better. That's not the case. What I want is I want the opportunity to hit the high standard. In 1994, I served on board the Dwight D. Eisenhower, uh, a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier out of Norfolk. Now, the Ike is it, it's in, history, in the history books for a reason, uh, and it's this. It's the first combatant ship in the Navy to have women on board. Up until this time, women weren't allowed to serve on ships in combat. You know, they were rele relegated to support ships and, and tenders and oilers and those kind of things. And when I got on board the Ike, there were about 10 women on board, 10 female sailors. And I, and I heard the grumbling right away. Well, this will never work. They don't belong here. Yeah. I don't know what they're doing here. I remember standing up in a meeting saying, yes, this is going to work. It's going to work just fine. And you know what? It did. It did. Those female sailors proved themselves. You know, The Navy took the time to uh, make the decision to include the, these female sailors. And, and that's really what, what inclusion is all about, is the opportunity to succeed. You know, and what happened on, on board the Dwight D. Eisenhower? The ship became a better ship. The Navy became a better Navy, right? I became a better sailor. Because I, up until this point, I had never really worked with female sailors before. So I became a better sailor, a more diverse uh, 
chief petty officer. And that's what inclusion is. That's what we need to do. But you see, we live in a society today that loves to judge people on what they see. You got American Idol, America, America's got talent. You know? But you've got somebody who stands different, runs different, looks different, has to use a power chair or a breathing device. What do we do? The expectations go down. They're automatically less than. They're automatically, they can't do the job. You know? I've proven what can be done. You know? We need to look past the, the, the barriers of people. And, and it's funny because I tell my story and after all I've accomplished in my life, when people find out that I have cerebral palsy, what happens? Oh, they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. They pat me on the head. And their expectations of me hit the floor. You know? We need to get past labels of people. Special needs, disability. Disability means without ability, right? If that's true, I guess I'm disabled when it comes to fractions, because I can't do them with a dang. You know? But I do have ability. Everybody has ability. Everybody has something to offer this world. I don't care who you are. Everybody has worth. You just have to find it. But in order to find it, you have to have the opportunity to show what you can do. We need to, we need to get there as a society. And we, and we need to do this. There's a reason that the employment participation rate for people with disabilities in this country, it's at about 20, 21%. You've got some money in a wheelchair applying for a job. You've got an able-bodied man applying for the same job. They've got the same resume. Who's going to get the job? The able-bodied man, in most cases. Why? Because it's easier. Companies don't want to take the time to look at their corporations, to look at their businesses, to look at their buildings, and say, what can we do to bring everybody in. You know? That's what inclusion is. That's what my story is. And that's why I'm here today. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you.